Good evening. It's, as always, a very deep privilege and pleasure to be with all of you and to be able to share with you this convocation experience. And tonight we have the opportunity to talk on a subject which should be of deep interest to all of us, which is cultivating a deeper faith. If we're going to cultivate these spiritual qualities, we have to start with one quality which Guruji mentions in his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita as being the foremost quality that every devotee has to develop to succeed in returning to God. And that quality is fearlessness. He said, fearlessness is the impregnable rock on which the house of spiritual life must be erected. Fearlessness means faith in God, faith in his protection, his justice, his wisdom, his mercy, his love, his omnipresence. Fearlessness means faith in God. The spiritually intrepid devotee is mightily armed against any foe that obstructs advancement. Disbelief and doubt, delusion's first line of attack, are similarly routed by undaunted faith. As our desires and all of their enticements that bluff with threats of unhappiness if they are not embraced. Fear robs one of the indomitable ability of his soul, disrupting nature's harmonious workings emanating from the source of divine power within. Fear causes physical, mental, and spiritual disturbances. Extreme fright can even stop the heart and bring sudden death. Long continued anxieties a low grade of fear, worry, gives rise to psychological complexes and chronic nervousness. Fear ties the mind and heart, that is the feeling, to the external man, the external woman, the body, the ego, causing the consciousness to be identified with mental and physical nervousness, thus keeping the soul concentrated on the ego, the body, the objects of fear. The devotee should discard all misgivings, realizing them to be stumbling blocks that hinder his concentration on the impenetrable peace of the soul. So one of the things we have to do if we have fearlessness, it gives us an opportunity as we go through life to practice those other qualities because we are not holding ourselves back and to accept the various things that come as we go through life in a proper attitude, to have a proper attitude toward them, to handle them in a very positive way. And for most of us, this requires some period of time and some period of practice of yoga to get to that point where we are able to handle things in a better way. Usually in the beginning, we aren't able to cope always that well. That should not discourage us. As we keep on, we will discover our ability to handle things of this nature becomes stronger. Now, we just come back this year from a trip to India, which is a very wonderful time we had over there to be able to visit all of Guruji's places and to visit the Kumbha Mela and so forth. And we had there not one, but many fascinating experiences this time. I'm going to just tell you one. Some of you have heard it, some of you have not. This was toward the end of our trip. We had just uh, left that morning the Kumbha Mela and gone by automobile to Banara Varanasi to visit the home of Lari Mahashai. And after visiting there in Dasasamed Ghat, we had to go out to the airport to catch the plane. And we had to get that plane because in a few days we were leaving. And because the traffic was pretty crowded and everything, because of the Kuma Mela, if we missed the plane, things could have gotten interesting. We had a wild trip because we got caught, caught in all kinds of traffic, and we got there over an hour after the plane was supposed to have gone. And on the way there, I was feeling, after meditating there at Lari Mahashai's house, I was feeling more closely to him than I'd ever felt before. And as we were traveling, I knew we couldn't get there in time, and I just said, well, Lari Mahashai, you stopped the train for Aboya. Will you stop the plane for us? 
It was very interesting. We got there and went dashing in. Over an hour late, the plane had not yet arrived. <laughs> well, that's not too unusual in India. <laughs> but the fact that it did arrive just five minutes after we got there, I said, well, I think maybe someone has something to do with this. Perhaps you've ever noticed if you're sometimes somebody or some individual or a group of individuals are really looking at you very intently and you're completely unaware of it and suddenly you'll just turn and look right at those people who are really looking, staring at you. Well, as I was standing there in the waiting room, I was like that. Some of the devotees had gone on to check at the plane, some of the other uh, monks actually. And suddenly I just turned and looked and here I saw sitting in the waiting room two people from the West somewhere. I, America, Europe, they were in Western dress. They were looking at me, and they had on their faces an expression of utter contempt. And I remember thinking, how fascinating. <laughs> and then thought no more about it. We, of course, were dressed in, our, in the Indian monastic garb there. Then the devotees who had taken us there, they took us not to the main waiting room, but to a small waiting room right next to us, and there was a window in between the two. And I didn't realize this, because I was sitting with my back to it, I didn't realize that the other people in the big waiting room could see what was going on where we were. So we were in there, and because we didn't have time to go and visit with them, the devotees there at the local center had very lovingly brought a meal there to the airport to feed us. So we were, the five of us monks were sitting in there and they fed us all. And then they gave us the full Indian royal treatment for the monastic. Pranam, garlanding us, pranaming, everything after they fed us. And then finally, he had one garland left over. I was sitting there and this happened to be of roses. And he, this devotee who was a traffic officer there, he took it and did like this with the roses over my head. So I was being showered with nothing but rose petals. So I'm sitting there, Jai Guru, Jai Guru, Om Guru, while he's doing this. I didn't realize all these people out there were seeing all this and indeed coming up and looking at it, you see. <laughs> Finally, after everything was over, the plane was late when it got there. It was still be more late because we didn't know they were holding the plane for us. Everybody else had gotten on board except us, and we're still waiting to go on board. And then we heard later they made an announcement saying, well, the plane was being held for some VIPs. <laughs> <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, when we got on plane, our seats were right opposite these two people who... <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't even look at us. They very studiously looked out the window. But I thought, isn't this fascinating? This is exactly yoga. This is an opportunity to practice yoga. Guruji said yoga means evenness of mind. When you go through a miserable experience, keep the mind even. When you go through an experience which is overly pleasant, keep the mind even. Liam does not make us any worse. Praise does not make us any better. We are what we are before God and Guru. So this even-mindedness is a quality of yoga and is something we have to develop. We have to learn to not take life's experiences too seriously. Now, we don't get rid of the problems of life by running away from them, by ignoring them, by hoping they will go away. Some people, when tests come, they run away. We should face our tests of life. The tests of life come to us not by accident, but by design. They are drawn to us by our karma not somebody else's karma, by our karma. And if we can learn to accept those tests and realize that one, we need them, and two, we deserve them, <laughs> then we can handle them in a much more positive way, if we can ever accept that fact. And you see, when people try to run away, and as many people all over the world, you see people today, it has become almost a world trait where many people are wanting to claim victim status. Oh, I'm a victim. You owe me, I'm a victim. What does that mean? It means we don't want to accept responsibility for our lives and our past lives and our karma. We're trying to put the blame elsewhere instead of realizing we have set in motion the circumstances that brought us to this particular situation. And therefore, we need to go through it with a positive attitude, grow with it, 
learn by it, and move on. So we have to learn not to give up. We have to develop more of a heroic attitude in life. Heroic meaning what we can accomplish. We are not egos, we are souls. And we have an opportunity in this life with the teachings that our guru has brought us to accomplish the utmost thing that we can accomplish in life. And that is a realization of the divine. He has brought us the means to do that. So we need to work on this heroic thing. We need to overcome. And that means we have to handle things with a positive attitude in life. And that can often be difficult. I'll tell you another story which happened when I first came into the ashram and I was working in our print shop at that time. And I was learning to run this press and, and I was printing the cover of the edition at that time of the Rajshi Janakanana Memorial little booklet. And I wasn't very good at running this press. It was pretty simple. There was nothing but a border and some type on there giving his name, Rajasi Janakanan, a memorial booklet or whatever it said I've forgotten. Anyway, every so often I'd pull one out to look at it and make sure it was printing right. And after some distance through, I pulled one out. And suddenly I noticed that the dot in the I in Rajarsi was gone. This was in the old days of hot metal. It had broken off. And as I checked back, I found about 500 of them didn't have that I on there. I put a new eye in and continued printing, separated those out. I went over to the monk who was my supervisor and told him what had happened. And it, of course he said, well, we're gonna have to put that dot that eye. I said, what? <laughs> we're gonna have to put that dot in the eye? Are you out of your mind? <laughs> I said, no way will I do that. And the moment I said that, I knew I would have to do it. And I most certainly did. <laughs> and I can't tell you how long it took me to dot those 500 eyes because there was only this one little piece of type there. And the big rollers would come over and they kept breaking it off. I'd get two printed, it would break. I'd have to put another one in, take everything out, put another one in, two more printed, it would break. It took me all day to print those 500. So have a good attitude. Have an attitude that comes from faith in God and that whatever experience we are going through is exactly what we need at that time so we can continue our spiritual progress. That's real faith. In the Bible, in Hebrews, St. Paul says, without faith it is impossible to please him, that is God, and we could also thereby say the guru. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, which is what all of us here are trying to do, and that's why we're here, because we are trying to diligently seek God, find God, know God, and rise above the weaknesses of human life. Now, one time someone asked Gurji, can faith alone save us? Gurji's answer, the Christian Bible says, faith without works is dead. And of course, that comes from St. James. And what he said was, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not these things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So we have to have a faith that operates in the world. And faith and belief are really have quite different meanings. And that we often use the terms interchangeably, and particularly we use the word faith to mean belief, when we should really be saying belief. Belief, we can believe anything. We can say, I believe this, I believe that. We can believe whatever we want to believe. But faith is the product of experience. Faith means, I know. I know because I have experience. Therefore, I know this is what the situation is. So you see, the meanings are really quite different. So Guruji said, belief is good only so long as it gives you the desire to realize what you are believing. Belief is good so long as it is an incentive to work out what you want to accomplish. 
Unless you work for what you believe in, you will not get it. Your faith must be tested to prove its value. Blind faith will not bring results. You must use the methods that bring results. India's great masters knew these methods. The Lord has said in the Bhagavad Gita that yoga is greater than the path of devotion because yoga is a scientific method of uniting the soul and spirit. You must learn the laws of concentration and meditation and use these methods again and again, then you will get results. Now you have all learned these, at least you learned them here if you have not already learned them. We all have had a chance to learn these methods of meditation and concentration, Om technique, Hong Sa technique, and some of you Kriya Yoga technique. Now what then is necessary? Use them, practice them. Don't just put them on the shelf and forget them. Make them a part of your daily life. That is what gives them the power. Lari Masha one time said, the power of Kriya lies in its practice. And that is true of all meditation techniques. Blind faith or faith without works will choke your reason. Do not say, tomorrow I will meditate longer. Tomorrow I will do this and that. You'll suddenly find that a year has passed by without your having done anything at all. Instead say, this can wait, and that can wait, but my search for God cannot wait. You ask if faith alone can save you. What is the meaning of saved? Why do we have to be saved? We are all the children of God. We are made in the image of God or spirit. The nature of spirit is omnipresence, omniscience. Salvation means freedom from the limitations that are imposed upon your soul by your body, by your ego, by your mind. Salvation, therefore, can come only through your own efforts. Now, the problem is delusion possesses us the moment we take on a body and are born. When we're born, what is the first thing we experience? Creation. We don't experience God. We experience creation. Creation is delusion. So saving in this case means to destroy that delusion which ordinarily is affecting us in our states of wakefulness and is nudging us to act in certain ways and usually to act not in the proper way. So that means giving attention to God again and again and again to the processes of meditation to taking the mind back to God. So if you follow the law, which is practicing the techniques and living the way one should, and if you have devotion, you cannot fail. You cannot fail. It's merely a matter of keeping after it. Sooner or later, you must succeed. And that should be of utmost sense of, of comfort to each and every one of us. We have the guru. We have the teachings. All we have to do is put it into action. You cannot fail. These words are the words of our guru, and they are words of every one of those who have practiced his teachings and seen that they do work. We should not think, oh, I'm different. They won't work for me. They work for you, but they're not going to work for me. No, they work for everybody. We are all souls. We are not different. We are all souls. And every one of us, I don't care what you have done, what you have been through, you can make it. Thank God, I might add, because otherwise I would be in deep trouble. <laughs> we can make it. So we have to prove what our true nature is, and that requires, in the beginning, belief. We have to believe that it is possible to find God and know God. Because in the beginning, we don't have faith. We have belief. But if you will take that belief and then put the techniques and other things into action, you will gradually see that belief turning into faith as time after time, God and Guru will take you deeper, you will have certain experiences, and you will see that what they have told you is true and that it works. Now, after that, there may come then times when it all vanishes again, it's all taken away, and you're struggling. You may even be dry, not feeling any love for God, any devotion to God, and you may say, you forget about it, and you're right back in the soup, so to speak, again. And that is when we have to remind ourselves again and again and again, hey, think back. Remember when it was so nice? It works. 
Don't be discouraged. Work through this difficult period. Go back and keep at it. Keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And I'll be the first to admit, sometimes it seems like you get on a plateau and that plateau stretches out day after day, month after month, year after year, and you think, I'm not getting anywhere. I'm stuck. But if you keep at it, suddenly one day, tuck, you're at a whole new level. It can happen just like that. One moment to the next. Suddenly everything has changed. So never be discouraged and give up. You don't know what moment that new level is going to pop in. There was one time a monk there, and he was wanting to leave the ashram, and Guruji was trying to dissuade him that he should stay. And Divine Mother even came to him in vision for a whole week, telling him, stay in the ashram. That's what you should be doing. He left. Not much faith there, was there? Not even much belief. Guruji said afterwards, if he would have stayed for six more weeks, all that negative karma would have been gone and done for. So hang in there. That's why I always say to everyone, including this one, keep on keeping on. That's the secret. So we don't want blind belief in God. We don't want a blind faith because that can be dangerous, because it can cause false expectations that God will come to us without us making the effort to find him. We don't accomplish anything that way. Gurji said, you are not the controller of the destiny of the world. Do not worry uselessly about the terrible things that are happening. That's good advice today because look at all the terrible things that are happening in this world. You must realize that God never forsakes the righteous and he loves all equally well and through his love we shall see a new world. He who has given life will again rehabilitate the world in a better way. You must help the world by your constructive thoughts. Perhaps you have failed to realize your divinity within. Why do you think that your body is aged or diseased? Every time your body deludes you, close your eyes and see that the body no longer exists for you. You are consciousness. You are vastness. But you have to realize this. Just believing will not suffice. God can be attained if you are very sincere and persistent, and if you can convince God that you want him, her, more than anything else in this world. More than anything else in this world. That's why it says, I guess, in the Western scriptures, God is a jealous God. You have to want him more than anything else. As long as we want something else more than God, he said, fine, enjoy it. No problem, except for us. <laughs> no problem for him. Enjoy it. Take as long as you want. <laughs> you never notice those kind of desires? You fulfill them, then after you fulfill them, you say, Shh, not very satisfying. I mean, it felt good for a minute or an hour or something. Now it's all gone. But God's love, God's presence is everlasting. That does not vanish away. It's always present right within us. So Master said, just as the breeze can be felt, although it is invisible, so the joy of God is tangibly present within your mind and around your body. And that is what we feel when we have a good meditation. You feel joy, peace, bliss with you. That is God's answer to your effort. Feel his presence, Master said. Taste the divine in reality, and you will never enjoy anything more than that. It is sufficient to overcome all your useless desires. The fulfillment of all worthwhile desires is the attainment of the divine. Because once you have that, you can have anything that you want. But you also then have the understanding not to want a lot of things, because you know you don't need them. You just take that which you should have. But you can have anything you want. So this is a letter that was written by our beloved Gyanamada, whose understanding of life and the spiritual path was indeed that of a mother of wisdom, which was her name, Gyanamata. She wrote this letter to a lady and she said, you asked for a list of the benefits that Yogada gives. 
That was what Master called, you go to Satsanga Society before, in the West he gave it an English translation to Self-Realization Fellowship. It teaches you to keep your body strong, fit, and free from pain by proper exercise. It tells you the effect of food and advises you what kind to eat if you wish to be well. It frees you from all kinds of fear, fear of poverty, of sickness, of loneliness, of death. It will explain to you that you need not be a failure, that you may have success in your chosen work and may find true and congenial friends. It will teach you how to think positively and will provide you with mental nourishment that will turn your mind into a storehouse of jeweled thoughts. It will teach you to look forward to the future with calm certainty, not full of worry and fear. Best of all, it will teach you by the practice of the lessons on concentration and meditation to turn religious belief into certainty. It will turn God from a word of three letters into a glorious realization, a well of calmness, peace, and bliss. Under the guidance of my master, it has done all this and much more for me, and many students all over the country can bear testimony to the truth of these words. Yes, they are true. What are you prepared to give in return? Will you give steadfast loyalty, patience, and earnest endeavor till the goal of bliss is reached? What are we willing to give in return? Will we make the effort? Will we have faith, true faith, which will come as we continue to make that effort? That is up to us. We are the ones who have to make that kind of progress, that kind of effort to make it happen. Now, many times we're faced with situations of test to our faith or our belief of one aspect of life or another. And I want to tell you this a story. You may have heard it before. I know I've used it before. Because good stories, good true stories, aren't that many that you can find. And so when you get a good one, you like to use it. And this is a good story because it's a true story of a devotee on this path. And she said, after a recent financial disaster, that is, her husband had to stop work to have an operation, was not going to be able to work for two months. And so that was a financial disaster for them. She said, without pay, so we thought, and with me expecting a baby. We had one dollar in the bank and several thousand dollars in bills due, with nowhere in this world to turn. So we turned to God alone. It was a tremendous lesson in learning to rely only on God and giving all troubles to him, and know you will be cared for. Know you will be cared for. See, that's, what, that's the faith that she learned from this, knowing you will be cared for, because she had the experience. So now she knows. I went to the Encinitas Retreat Gardens for meditation for some help in our darkest hour, and it came to me that in complete trust, all will be taken care of. Master never lets us down. Then I knew I had to donate whatever was left in my pocketbook to Master's work with complete faith that we also would be helped. I looked in my wallet and saw only a dime. But then my eye caught sight of the last dollar bill tucked away, which I pretended not to see as a little flood of fear and doubt came over me, remembering we had no food. I took the dime and dropped it in the donation box and started for my car. I heard Master say, as clear as he was standing right in front of me, which I am now convinced he was, now what kind of trust is that? <laughs> I was caught in my tracks. I smiled and trusted this time and willingly gave my last dollar. As soon as our consciousness turned 100% dependent on God, our situation immediately changed. The next day, we received in the mail 100-fold of that little dollar, a check for $100 from a dear lady we hadn't seen in years. 
and it has been that way ever since. My husband is back to work, but we continue to receive money from the strangest sources. We were able to pay every bill we ever had and able to save up for several months. We have been truly taken care of and blessed many times over by our beloved Master. Are you willing to let him bless you? We have to want the blessing. We have to trust the blessing will come. And yet I went through something similar like that many years ago. I went through a period of time when I was in the ashram, having come from an engineering background, and before I went in the ashram, I'd been making good money. And then I was in the ashram, and basically we get a little tiny allowance. At that time, it was even tinier. And uh, I began, there was such a change in my lifestyle in that sense that I began to become a little bit concerned and think I had to watch every penny so I could save up money to buy a pair of shoes and all of this sort of thing. So we had to out of this little allowance buy our clothes and all our other necessities. And I developed a poverty consciousness. I didn't realize it at first. I was holding on to every penny until it screamed before I would let it go. <laughs> and then one day I suddenly realized what I was doing. And I thought, this is ridiculous. And I went to Scientific Healing Affirmations where he has affirmations for material success. And I picked one there and I started to repeat that. I dwelt in thoughts of poverty and wrongly fancied I was poor, so I was poor. Thy consciousness has made me wealthy, made me rich. I am now with thee. I am wealthy. I am rich. And I kept repeating that. And the most interesting things started to happen after that. I started to get things just like this lady. Things started to come to me from every which way. Things which I wanted and never asked for, or wouldn't, they just started showing up. And it's been that way ever since. Don't dwell in thoughts of poverty. Everything is present in God. You're God's child. Get rid of poverty consciousness. Realize that if we live and have faith as we should, we will have what we need. Not necessarily always what we want, but what we need. Because sometimes what we want isn't good for us. We don't know that, but God does, Guru does. So have that kind of trust in God. Have that kind of strong belief that turns into faith. Master said, we cannot know God by blind faith, faith that is devoid of works, which means spiritual effort, because it will smother your reason. So we'll have to work to gain whatever we have, and that work can come in different ways. It can come through outward work, can come through spiritual work, and therefore faith comes, you see? Spiritual work can bring us faith, and that is what we are trying to accomplish. This is another great story which shows what we can do if we have trust and if we work at it, if we make the effort to cultivate faith and trust. To cultivate this greater awareness of God, we should not surrender to negative outward conditions or even negative inward conditions. Whatever conditions confront us, remember they are exactly the next step in our spiritual unfoldment. Whatever conditions confront us. Right there is our next opportunity to move on. So if we are attacked by these bad qualities we have as we are those of us who now have these techniques of pranayama, we are considered to be spiritual warriors. It is our duty to resist these negative influences in our life and to overcome them. This story from the Indian scriptures illustrates this point, and it is a story about the life of Valmiki, who was the man who wrote the Ramayana, the history of Lord Rama. Valmiki in his early life was not a nice man. In fact, he was a pretty bad man. In fact, he was worse than that. <laughs> he was not only a robber, he was a murderer. So one day, he had, in the forest where he was living, he had stopped some sages, and he was going to strike them down and rob them. And one of them said to him, I see you are an intelligent man. Surely you must realize the terrible sin you're creating for yourself with all this murder and robbery. 
I know about the sin, Valmiki replied, but I have to feed my wife and children. Ah, I understand. You're doing this for your wife and children. So I suppose your wife and children are willing to share in the sin you are creating. Hmm, well, Valmiki didn't know if that was true or not. So he tied the saints up and went home to find out. <laughs> when he arrived, he found his wife cooking some rice that he had stolen. I see you're cooking some of my stolen rice, so I wonder if you are willing to share in the sin of my having stolen it. His wife was aghast. I have no sin, she said. I have merely cooked the rice. I haven't stolen it. Then Valmiki went outside where he found his children and he asked them, suppose it turned out that the food you are eating was stolen. Will you share the sin of the person who stole it? And they said, sin? No way. It is your duty to feed us. How you do it is your business. We are not responsible. <laughs> so Valmiki went back and he let the sages go. But this, you see, got him to thinking. And it's like, what, sort of like Gurji said, the world influences you to sow the seeds of useless bad habits, material desires, and God-forgetting activities. But the world does not have to answer for your poisonous harvest. You alone are accountable for the effects of your past actions. It takes courage, moral courage, to fight against degrading outward circumstances or inner circumstances in our life and to hold tightly to godly principles and qualities, and yet it is vitally necessary. It takes trust, it takes faith, it takes strong belief. So how can we overcome these? Well, let's go back to Valmiki. He was now very concerned about all his bad karma, and he wanted to change his way of life. So he returned to the forest and he asked one of the sages what he should do. And the sage told him to repeat constantly the name of Rama, a great incarnation of God, because this is very purifying. But Valmiki had already accumulated so much evil karma that the divine name wouldn't even come out of his mouth. The best he could do was to turn the syllables around and say Mara, 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 which in Sanskrit is a word for evil or delusion. However, his desire was sincere, and as he kept on repeating Mara, 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 eventually he found it turned into Rama, Rama, Rama. He persevered in immersing his mind and consciousness in the vibration of that holy name. Each repetition cleansed his consciousness more and more, and eventually he went into ecstasy. He completely turned his life around and found God. Then he wrote the Ramayana. So if someone like that can do it, we don't have too much of an excuse, do we? <laughs> so, look, he didn't even have the techniques we had. He had Japa Yoga, repeating the divine name. Think of that. And despite all that he'd done, he found God. So don't be discouraged if it is difficult in the beginning. Remember Valmiki. Be like Valmiki. Keep on trying until we change. That's what we have to learn to do. Make the effort, make the effort, keep on keeping on. Our master said again, repeating, this can wait, that can wait, but my search for God cannot wait. We have to, you see, we have to keep bringing the mind back to these things because we are constantly surrounded by the influence of creation. You wake up in the morning, what is the first thing? You see the body, you see creation out there, and our body's part of creation. What's the first thing we see? We take in creation. And so unless we make a specific effort to take the consciousness away from creation and inward, take it inward through meditation to find God, we are constantly immersed in delusion. And it has a tremendous effect upon us. So we need to constantly bring the mind back, bring the mind back. That's why Guruji wants us to meditate every day, twice a day. He didn't just say that because it was a nice thing to say. He said that because it's a very necessary thing for us to do if we want to attain that liberation. We have to keep at it, keep at it, keep at it, and not be discouraged. And we can do that. But it's not enough to merely memorize Master's teachings, although it's good to understand his teachings. He wants us to read them every day, to absorb his teachings. We can even memorize them, but that in itself will not save us if we don't practice them. We have to practice them. And I remember there was a man in my early years in the ashram, I think I'd been there just 
what, a year and a half, two years, he came back to the ashram. He'd been a monk before he had left. In fact, he'd left several times, even while Gurji was still there. He had left and come back, left and come back. Gurji always took him back, left and come back, left and come back. Now he'd come back after Gurji was passing. He'd come back again, he'd give, give him another try. And I got to know him, and he understood the teachings very, very well. And at this time, I was working in the print shop all by myself. I was the only one in the whole building except for him working in another room because they hadn't moved the rest of the presses over there. And I was having real difficulty with this press, trying to run this press. And every so often, I'd completely lose my cool and say a few ill-chosen words. <laughs> and because there was no one else around in the building, I guess I didn't get too worried about it. But. Uh, he heard it, and so he would come out of the office and come over and have a talk with me. And he understood Master's teachings very well, and he would talk, calm me down, cool me off, calm me down, and get me back focused again. And I really appreciate that, and still do to this day. He was a very big help to me at that particular time in my life. And he was telling me some of the problems he'd had, why he'd left the ashram before one time. And so we made a compact together. I said, if ever, the compact was, if either one of us ever saw the other one walking out of the front gate, we'd hit him over the head and drag him back in. <laughs> I didn't want to take any chances. And I didn't think he did either after, you know, four times already leaving. But you know what that rascal did? He was living outside the grounds because at that time we didn't have enough room in the grounds for everyone, so he was living just outside the grounds in a place there, a room there. He went down to Encinitas for some weekend to have a weekend retreat, and when he came back to his room, he never did show back up in the grounds again where I could have hit him over the head. I mean, he just simply vanished. And I thought, you rascal, you. So you see, we can, if we don't put it into practice, it doesn't matter how much we know it. That's like blind belief. Practicing it is faith. We have to practice it. Then it works. Now I'm going to give you a beautiful example of faith which shows a pure faith or belief of an innocent child. That's the kind of thing we have to develop. A child is very pure. And when it believes something, it believes something with its whole heart, his, his or her whole mind, whole being. They believe. And that kind of belief can cause great results. That was the kind of belief this little boy had. His mother told this story. She said, the doctor closed his bag and turned to me. Call me if he gets any worse this afternoon or tonight. I'll stop by in the morning to see him. If he's no better, I'll have to put him in the hospital. He needs fluids and he must eat. I've given him everything I can think of, but he just can't keep anything down. You must keep on trying. He is getting weak and dehydrated. Do your best, I'll see you tomorrow morning. I sat down in the rocking chair by the sofa where my little son lay. Bobby had always been thin and undersized. Now, after days of battling an especially severe case of influenza, he looked wan and wasted. What could I do if he had to be hospitalized? I was a nursing student at Florida State University at Tallahassee and had no hospitalization insurance and very little money. What if the hospital refused to admit him? I prayed silently, Lord, show me what to do. Bobby, suppose I go to the store and buy a different kind of soup for you and maybe some jello. Don't you think you might be able to eat some? No, Mama. Can't you think of anything you'd like? Make me some shoe fly pie, Mama. I could eat that. I know I could. Bobby had never eaten shoe fly pie in his life. How could he desire something he had never seen or tasted? Yet I knew why he had asked. To pass the long, weary hours of illness, I had been reading stories to him from library books. Yanni van der Noes by Marguerite de Angeli was his favorite. It was a story of Yanni, a little Amish boy from the Pennsylvania Dutch area, and it described vividly the customs, dress, food, and daily activities of the Amish. My life had been spent in Georgia and Florida. I knew nothing of the Amish, had never seen an Amish person, Never tasted a Pennsylvania Dutch dish. What on earth is shoe fly pie? A custard pie? 
a shepherd's pie. The little story had mentioned shoe fly pie, but it failed to list the ingredients. I doubted the wisdom of experimenting with strange exotic foods in the middle of a serious illness. However, it was the only food Bobby had requested, and maybe it was worth trying. Whatever was in it was probably not going to stay in him long enough to do him any harm anyway. Having made the decision to act on Bobby's request, I set about locating a recipe. The Leon County Library did not have a book on Pennsylvania Dutch cookery, and neither did the State Library. The library at Florida State University had such a cookbook, but it was in use and not due back for two weeks. I called nearby bookstores. They had no Pennsylvania Dutch cookbooks. I called my neighbors, friends, relatives. Some of them had heard of shoe fly pie, but none of them knew what it was. Bobby, there isn't a recipe for shoe fly pie in this town. I'm just as sorry as I can be, but after you are well, we will try again, but right now we're going to have to get you something you can eat. I'm going to the grocery store to try and find something that will be easy for you to get down. Your grandfather will sit with you while I'm away. What store are you going to, Mama? I'll ask God to send you a recipe there. He'll send you one. <laughs> oh, no, Bobby, I said in alarm. Please don't do that. No, he had belief. She sure didn't. And there was obviously no way for God to provide a recipe in a grocery store. I'd already tried all the likely places. It would be best for Bobby not to ask for the impossible. God will know how to send you a recipe, Mommy. Are you going to win Dixie? Yes, I'm going to win Dixie. Don't ask God, honey. I'll be back soon with something good. In Win Dixie, I pushed my shopping cart, filling it with red and green jello, butterscotch pudding, chicken noodle soup, and then nearing the checkout counter. I stood stock still, not believing what I saw. Walking in the door were two women, one wearing a black prayer cap, the other a white one, just like the pictures in Yanni Vandernoes. <laughs> Hurrying toward them, I asked, are you Amish? Yes, we are Amish. And do you know how to make shoe fly pie? Of course, all Amish women know how to make shoe fly pie. <laughs> Could you write me a recipe? Yes, yeah, certainly. If you have paper, I'll write it down, and then we'll help you find the things you need to make a nice pie. And we walked around together, gathering brown sugar, molasses, and spices, and I asked them if they'd ever before been in, or if they lived in Tallahassee. Oh, goodness, no. We're just passing through. We've been down in Florida on our way back to Pennsylvania. I don't know why we stopped in here, but... <laughs> <laughs> but all of a sudden, my companion said, let's stop at that Wind dixie So here we are. And I really don't know why we came in. <laughs> Awestruck, humbled, and ashamed, I knew why. Bobby had disobeyed me. He had asked and received. You know, Gurdjieff said that many times we do not receive many things we could have because we don't ask for them. We're too bashful or too shy or whatever. No, I'm not suggesting you ask for things that you know, dumb things, but as for good things. When I walked into the living room of the groceries, Bobby said, you got the recipe God sent you, didn't you, Mama? <laughs> Absolutely pure belief turned into faith. That recipe made not one but two large shoe fly pies. Bobby ate almost the whole pie during the late afternoon and early evening and drank several cups of weak tea. Moreover, he retained all he ate and drank. The pie, high in carbohydrates, provided energy, and the tea replaced lost body fluids. By morning, Bobby was able to drink fruit juices and eat poached eggs and toast. His improvement thereafter was rapid and dramatic. This is the kind of faith and trust we should develop. This is what we all need to work on. Develop more of that faith, and it's, you get it by going after it by wanting it and by believing it will come and happen, but by also making the effort to improve and spiritualize our lives. This is what we have to do. Now, many philosophers, particularly in the West, take a defeatist attitude that God is unknowable. And yet, Lord Krishna, the Bhagavad Gita, and the great masters of India and other places such as Jesus Christ and Lord Buddha and others, Muhammad have all said differently. Moses, they have told us God is knowable and that the highest truth is knowable by direct experience. So it's up to us to make that effort to work on ourselves and bring these things in 
to our lives, to make them happen. That is up to us, and each one of us can do that. Master said, it is the nature of faith to create anything which it wants. It is the nature of faith to create anything which it wants, just like it did for that boy. Remember, he wanted a recipe? He got it. When the soul continuously remains identified with the dream delusive body, it puts on its weaknesses and forgets to exercise the all-powerful faith hidden within the soul. This faith is lost by soaring over or getting elated over the changing conditions of sickness and health which invade the body. When sickness comes, you remember what Sri Yukteswar said, refuse to recognize an unwelcome visitor and he will flee. Have you ever practiced that? I have, and it can work. Same way with other difficult things. How often are we willing to use our mind, power of the mind, and the power of faith, and the power of belief to resist these things that aren't all that pleasant? Remember, it is the nature of faith to create everything it wants. The soul can neither be sick nor healthy, for it is made in the bodiless image of the perfect God. Any soul who realizes himself to be the perfect image of God is not elated by the dream health of the body, nor is he grieved or disturbed by the dream sickness of the physical temple. You see, sometimes, yes, sometimes we have to go through illness. There's a reason for us going through illness. God doesn't always take it away. Sometimes we have to go through something. We have to learn something by going through the illness. But then, still, don't believe that it is something lasting. Realize, hey, this too shall pass away. Something comes and goes. Take, again, remember we talked about evenness of mind is yoga. Person who has faith will have evenness of mind. Gurdjie said, there is a way to cultivate belief until it becomes faith or absolute conviction. Belief is the initial recipient attitude of the mind necessary for the seed of a desire to be planted. When the soil of belief is continuously watered with belief in the self, that is the soul, and a master, that is your guru, then it sprouts into faith or absolute conviction that the desired result will be accomplished. It is the cosmic conviction of God that is all-powerful and has created stars, planets, human beings. God knows that he is all-powerful. He intuitively feels he can do anything, so whatever he thinks he can do, he does. So souls, by deeper and deeper meditation, can ultimately acquire the almighty intuitive conviction of God. When souls possess that intuitive conviction, they will understand that all cosmic vibrations of matter and its manifestations are controlled and guided by God's intuitive conviction. When advanced souls find their convictions in tune with God's convictions, then they realize the relation of intuition and matter. Thus, an advanced soul, by the power of his intuitive conviction, can create anything in matter, as we see in the lives of the great masters. When Christ changed the water into wine, when he could walk on water, or do all these other things, how do the masters do that? They have the same intuitive conviction that God has, that everything is possible for them to do. And so they can do it. Gurdjie goes on, it is only when you have developed your faith by God contact that you can accomplish anything. Ah, now he tells us what we've got to do. We've got to develop that faith by contacting God. And he has given us the means to contacting God. Our part is to make the effort so we can contact God. And we do contact God. Sometimes, perhaps much more than we realize, we don't realize sometimes just how much of a contact we have had with God. At other times, it comes in a way that cannot be denied. When I went to uh, India this time, I had never felt very close to Lari Mahashai. I felt close to Guruji. I felt close to Sri Yukteswarji. I felt close to Divine Mother and sometimes other aspects of God I'd chosen. But gradually, I sort of narrowed my thing down to Guru and Divine Mother as the forms I went through. And like I say, it was sort of Sri Yukteswarji off on the side there. <laughs> but I never felt close to Lari Mahashaya. 
But after this trip to India, I realized I had to change my thinking processes because he really showed me. He's very interesting. <laughs> we went to his place. Those of you who saw the slideshow, we showed you there. We went to his place in his uh, disciple, Swami Keshwananda's place in Haridwar, where he had taken back some of the ashes and put them in a little shrine, and we went there and sat down to meditate. And the moment we sat down to meditate, bam, I mean, it was a different world. And I've tried to, like I say, I've tried to think, how can I explain what I experienced at that moment? That's difficult to do because the words are basically contradictory. The best I could explain it was the moment I sat down, I turned my gaze inwardly, I felt as if I was right at the edge of infinity. Well, how can you be at the edge of infinity? I wasn't in it, blast it. I was just at the edge. <laughs> so he let me know there's still some work I had to do. But still, that was pretty encouraging to uh, see that, yeah, it goes on. It gets better. Keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. Don't give up. Keep after it. When you have acquired this God consciousness which controls all the dream forms in the cosmos, then through that consciousness you can create any changes in the universe. But this power to accomplish anything by faith cannot come by doing nothing or by mere belief. It comes by constant demand for cosmic consciousness in meditation and prayer and by remaining aloof from body consciousness and particularly by occasional fasting to just break the connection with the body sometimes. The power of faith or intuitive conviction, Master says, does not come by a mental belief or intellectual conviction, but by regular deep prayer and meditation and subjecting the body to the discipline involved in fasting and moral living. And moral living. We want to connect with God, we have to pay the price. It will not come if we just sort of flirt around the edges. Many people have done that, and incarnation after incarnation are still flirting around the edges. The time comes sometime when we have to say, I want it, I'm going to get it, and I'm going to do whatever I need to get it, and go after it. This has, I think, come over me strongly in the last several years where I realize it's not enough to want to be close to the guru. It's not even enough to ask him to use us as his disciples, but we have to go and consciously and continually consciously invite him, come in, come in, come in. Use me. I'm your disciple. Use me. And I've taken really to doing that. And I've gone up sometimes to give a service there at Lake Shrine. And when I went up, I didn't even know what to say. I felt I'd gone over the talk, and it just seemed like something foreign to me. I said, I don't feel comfortable with this. I don't know how I'm going to express it. I, I would go up there, and I'd go to the altar, and I would pranam, and I would, I would just simply say to Guruji, Master, I have nothing to give. You have wisdom. You have love. You have joy. You have peace. You have understanding. Let that flow through me to help these devotees. I'm your instrument. Use me. And he will. He will. And the instrument is blessed by being used. Bring Master more into your life. Don't put him out there somewhere. Bring him into your life. Make him a part of your life. Talk to him. Talk to him. Meditate. After you've meditated, devotees say, well, what should I do after I meditate? Talk to him. Pour out your heart to him. You can tell him anything. He won't be surprised. He already knows it anyway. <laughs> tell him anything, but ask his help. Ask his help to overcome delusion. Ask him to use you. Because that's what being a disciple is all about. Remember what Gyanamata said back there in that letter earlier? It's not just, she said, what will you give in return? You're getting all these beautiful things brought into your life. What are you willing to give? 
Are you willing to be loyal? Are you willing to practice? Are you willing to be a disciple and help your guru and ask him to use you? We can all do that. And I've seen, I say this really hit me just about three years ago. Suddenly this really, for some reason, came very strongly in my consciousness. And I've been doing that for the last three years. And it's made a change. We can change our lives. Master's given us the way, but we have to practice it. So again, Gurji goes on. Thus, as the consciousness of the devotee is finally united to cosmic consciousness, he realizes that he can create any changes in the cosmic dream which is sustained by that cosmic consciousness. And so bit by bit, as we go on trying to please our guru, practicing the techniques, developing through meditation, intuition, and as that intuition comes, bringing in that intuitive conviction, true faith, because we experience and know, we can change our lives and help change this world. And this world needs a lot of change. But it's not hopeless. He said, we'll change, but we can all play a role. Master said, one moon gives more light than a thousand stars. One devotee, deeply seeking God and practicing meditation, can overcome the negation of many ordinary people. Don't think that your little bit is not of value. Every little bit of each one of us makes this world that much better. So let us do the best that we can. And I want to close with... This whispers from eternity from Gurji, called Inflame Us With Thy Consciousness. And as we read this bit by bit, please repeat mentally. Look at your spiritual eye and repeat mentally these words. Eternal light, pour down through our thoughts, through our feelings, and through our emotions. Eternal love, pour down through our love, and make us feel thy presence. Eternal power, pour down through our wisdom and inflame us with thy consciousness. Purify the dross in us and banish disease and poverty from the world evermore. Banish ignorance from the shores of our souls. Lead us from darkness to light, from ignorance to wisdom, from sorrow to bliss, from death to immortality. You can have it all. Be faithful, loyal, and true, and you will. God and Guru bless you all.